Hello and welcome to a new series on my channel called Deltarune Theory. Here we're going to do what else? Theorize about different aspects of the new upcoming game by Toby Fox called Deltarune. What this will include is themes, character arcs, little details, and more. I want to cover just about everything one could want to know about the game, and while that's a fair amount of stuff to go over, I don't expect the series to be more than, say, 10 parts. This series will also expect you to have watched it sequentially, hence why episodes are numbered. That said, how I will be covering this information does have a personal touch to it. I'm not going to go over everything beat by beat. The shape of these videos will for the most part be making multiple points while having a through line that's made clear by the title of the video. Darkness. Darkness in Deltarune is introduced to us through the game's opening. Deltarune is going for a classic fantasy sort of vibe, and this is evident through the opening. Light and dark must remain in balance in order for people to live in harmony. If something happens to the sacred status quo, then everything will go wrong, yada yada. It's your job, as the protagonist, to make sure that doesn't happen. The how and why of that, though, is interesting. You see, while many stories have different ideas for what light and dark really means, whether it be staying true to yourself or avoiding impulse and that sort of thing, here they are very tangible, very real things that can be messed with. It's only mentioned toward the end of this monologue, but there's something in the middle of the kingdom that your main character and everyone else is staying in. It's called a dark fountain. Dark fountains are things which are said to give the land form. What this means is that the very ground you're standing on, everything around you, even the people around you, are made because of the fountain. It's very metaphorical in nature, but I want to dissect those aspects of it later. For now, we're just going to lay out everything that is told to us about dark fountains. There is one dark fountain in the center of the kingdom, and it is called the Grand Fountain. The Grand Fountain is one half of the balance we were talking about earlier. The Grand Fountain creates darkness, and as such, provides balance with light. The reason why the balance of light and dark shifts is because another dark fountain appears. It's prophesized in the opening that us, a human named Chris, along with a monster named Susie in a dark world being called Ralsei, will seal the new dark fountains that get made, and restore balance, while also doing some other things that aren't relevant yet. This opening is actually told to us by Ralsei. See, while this is in fact the game's opening we've been going over, this opening is shown to us, say, 20 minutes into playing the game. Well, why is that? There's a lot of reasons, but we have to go over something else first. This opening, what is described as the prophecy, has something really strange about it. It's got the same art style as Undertale's opening. In fact, Undertale's got a huge presence in just about everything Deltarune is doing. So let's talk about that for a bit. Deltarune expects you to play after Undertale. In that way, it's comparable to a sequel, but the exact nature of when or how it takes place isn't important to talk about right now. Let me tell you how official sources put it. The next adventure in the Undertale series has appeared. Fight, or spare, alongside new characters in Undertale's parallel story, Deltarune. Deltarune calls itself Undertale's parallel story, and slots itself as being the next adventure in the Undertale series. That by itself should give enough grounds to the idea you're supposed to play Deltarune after Undertale, but both the Undertale and Deltarune websites also say this outright. Why going over this information is important is because I need you to look at Deltarune under that lens, as Undertale's parallel story. With that in mind, we can go over choices like the game's opening being in the same style as Undertale's with expectations. Much like how Undertale introduces the concept of humans and monsters, Deltarune does the same with Lightners and Darkners. Darkners being the beings made from the fountains, and Lightners being the characters who come from the light world, a place which in this game essentially stands in for our real world. Undertale also goes over the barrier in its opening, as well as the concept of magic with that, things which are overarchingly important to its story. Because of that being the case, we can think about the story elements gone over in Ralsei's prophecy as being similarly relevant to what Undertale goes over with its opening. To me, it's important to lay this out, because even though it might seem obvious that this long intro sequence will have relevance later, going over how it's similar to Undertale's gives us something to tether those expectations to. Darkness, from this, we can assert is going to be something very important to the wider story. So let's talk about it more in depth as a story element. 
As mentioned earlier, Deltarune is going for a very classic fantasy sort of vibe. There are many things that support this, but let's focus on how that's something the game itself is aware of. Deltarune is a game about kids playing fantasy in a closet. The plot of the game has you, as Chris, go to school, and when you're asked by the teacher to get something out of the closet, you fall into a fantastical world full of lush landscapes and absurdly groovy music. What you learn as you play, though, is that you're fighting enemies themed around playing cards. One area you travel through is a chessboard. Then, by the time you've toppled the King of Card Castle, you get to seal the fountain, and suddenly, everything goes back to normal. You're just in an unused classroom, with checkers pieces and a toy littered around. While sort of alluded to by Susie kind of brushing the entire thing off, what the game is going for here is to make it seem like everything you're doing in the dark world could just be kids goofing off in a closet together, making stuff up. The important distinction about that though is that it very much so isn't them just making it up. Darkness, as gone over earlier, is what gives the land you traverse through form. It makes these people exist, essentially. But to focus on the minutia of it, these chess pieces, this deck of cards, they all exist before the Dark Fountain is made. King perhaps illustrates this the best, with his sentiments against the protagonists. He and the rest of his kingdom, the deck of cards and everything else, was left in the unused classroom. Because he, as a playing card, could never do what he was designed to do, when the fountain was created, King took up arms for being left in the dust. The fountain, then, created a personality based around the objects. It gave the land form. Darkness does this to things, and I want to focus on why that is. Light vs. Dark is a story element as old as time. The difference is that darkness is a very real, tangible thing here. Even with that, though, darkness has a more metaphorical meaning to it. Something that Deltarune intentionally focuses on with the Dark World is how much it feels like wish fulfillment. There's a home you can always go to, with everything you want in it. Any and all wounds can be healed like it's nothing. Magic exists in the Dark World, but not the Light World. The wish fulfillment nature of it even applies in some ways to Ralse, the third main character of the game, but we'll go over that more in his own video. For now, I want to lay out this element of the story as a choice the game is making, because you have to ask, if the main gameplay is set in the Dark World, if everything is better and more fantastical there, then why does the Light World even exist in the narrative? Hear me out here. Darkness, existing as it does, is basically a stand-in for the concept of fantasy, just like in general. You understand? What the game is doing, Deltarune, is making it so the actual practice of going into a closet and playing around with your friends is a very real thing with real rules. The reason why the balance of light and dark is important to the story is because if you let yourself get too wrapped up in fantasy, everything falls into chaos. That's the message the game is making. Even though by all accounts, living in your mind palace would be easier, it wouldn't be better. Everyone would suffer for it. Because of that, the dark fountains being created is bad. It means that if they continue to flow, living in fantasy will outweigh your time spent in real life. You could say that on some level we already see the consequences of this. Focusing on sealing the dark fountains, Chris and Susie miss class in studying, things which are important. Darkness is, as a result of being this way, a very meta construct of the game's world. You can see why it's mentioned as soon as it is, and why the game takes time to set up the light world as well. Darkness stands in for the concept of fantasy in this way, with the game's messaging. Undertale did something very similar to this, with how it explored the concept of determination. In Deltarune, we find out that determination is something that all Lightners possess, and that it is necessary in order for someone to create a Dark Fountain. You might have caught this already, but there are important differences between Undertale and Deltarune's world. Deltarune has it so the Light World has no magic, but in the Dark World, there is magic. Undertale has magic be a normal part of its world. This being the case, it's interesting that determination is important in this way. Let's analyze what exactly determination is in Undertale so we can all be on the same page. Determination in Undertale is just the actual, real emotion, and you're introduced to it that way. 
When you interact with a save point, the game is telling you why you feel the need to keep going. It centers you with its consistency, because every save point uses that same word. When your perception of that changes is when you get access to the true lab. There you find entries which reveal that determination is an actual substance in the game's universe. There is a machine that can extract determination from people, and it can be injected into people. Break that down in your mind for a second. What the game is doing with this is making it so the existing nature of determination as a concept is something more physical and tangible in this universe. It's something that exists in our real world, but which has a more direct science to it here. With this in mind, it being necessary to create a dark fountain makes sense in Deltarune. If darkness stands in for the concept of fantasy in general, imagination, then it's natural to assume you need will to make a dark world. You need the willpower necessary to give life by making a fountain. All lightners have some amount of imagination, they just need to use it. This is how determination and darkness intertwine with one another within the narrative, and as things which are plot elements. Something that we need to talk about though is how determination is relevant to Deltarune at all. We went over how magic is different between the two games, but not other unique elements. Souls are an important part of Undertale because of its very emotionally focused messaging, but here people know less about them. Bringing all of this up, I want to make a statement. Determination is relevant to Deltarune, and the opposite is also true. Darkness has a place in Undertale's world as well. You may or may not have heard about it before, but in Undertale, there's a secret area in the game which has something in it called Entry Number 17. Only accessible by manipulating which room the game puts you in, what you're seeing right now is all that it is. It's these weird symbols, which as you might guess, mean something. Getting into how exactly this message is translated isn't important right now. What does matter is telling you what it actually says. So let me do that for you here. Entry number 17. Dark. Darker. Yet darker. The darkness keeps growing. The shadows cutting deeper. Photon readings, negative. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. As you can see for yourself, this body of text is an entry, much like the ones we see in the True Lab. It also talks about darkness. Let me make a statement before any conclusions can be jumped to. This is foreshadowing for Deltarune. That's not all this body of text is, but it is a very important thing about it. We got to this area by manipulating game files. So while we're here, why don't we look at what the game calls this place? Gaster. The room is just called Gaster. Now, you may or may not be familiar with that name. It's plenty understandable if you aren't. Gaster is the name of a secret character in Undertale. To put it simply, it's luck-based whether or not you learn anything about him. These characters, labeled as G followers, can appear only in specific spots, depending on arbitrary luck. This is all starting to sound pretty crazy, but I urge you to stay with me. Undertale and Deltarune are both games with very meta elements. Undertale's battle system is, by itself, based around meta expectations people have about video games. Undertale and Deltarune's core is built around meta self-awareness. This, a secret character existing in the game with mysterious lore, is a part of that. It plays into people's expectations about games in general. That said, I don't want to talk much about Gaster just yet, even though there's plenty to go over. I want to focus, now, on why Gaster is relevant to darkness, as a concept. Gaster is explained to be the royal scientist before Alphys. He is the one who created the entire area of the core, and something mysterious has happened to him. One day, he vanished, and quote, shattered across time and space. This all in mind, I'm going to ask something of you. Assume for me that the person talking here, in entry number 17, is Gaster. 
They're writing entries in a similar way to Alfie's, so it makes sense. We went over how the room itself is named Gaster, so from that, it's all but stated who's speaking. Now let's shift gears for a bit. You're probably unaware, but the website for Deltoon has actually been up for longer than the game's been released. It was first posted in 2016, only a year after Undertale came out. During this time, it was nothing but an all-black webpage, except there's a message hidden in it. What you're looking at is actually an image file. If we increase the brightness of the image, it shows this. The same strange symbols that entry number 17 uses. What this text says, too, is very important. Here's what it says. Three heroes appeared to banish the angel's heaven. I hadn't gone over it earlier intentionally, but this is an excerpt from Deltarune's opening. The implications of this are staggering. We know Gaster is relevant to Deltarune because of this, and that's why earlier I said so certainly that entry number 17 is foreshadowing for Deltarune. But as I said, there's a ton of stuff to go over regarding why Gaster is important and where he appears in Undertale and Deltarune. So let's keep things simple for now, break down only the stuff that's necessary for you to know regarding the topic of this video. Darkness. I just showed you the secret in this image, but I didn't tell you what the file is actually called. It's simply called him. Now this doesn't mean much on its own, but it will help me plot out the back half of this video for you. I mentioned earlier how the G followers are luck based, whether or not they appear. Well, see, there's a whole system which these characters are a part of. Not only does the system make it so that occasionally these guys appear, but it also makes it so other special things can happen. One of these things that can happen is encountering the sound test. I'm going to assume you don't know what a sound test is, so I can explain why this is special. Okay, a sound test is a screen in a video game where you can listen to all the sounds in the game. The reason why it's called that is because primarily, it's a developer tool. It exists to make sure everything sounds right, but some games include them as features you can access. Sometimes in games, sound tests aren't even actually used for testing. It can just be used as a term for a music player in the game. This is what Undertale does, but things are off. The music tracks you listen to in the sound test, none of them are accessible to listen in any way otherwise. Happy Town, Trouble Dingle, Meat Factory, they're all exclusive to this screen. There's one more song in this selection, though. Gaster's theme. I want you to take a listen to it. What's notable about this track is its title, both the one we're told it has and what the song is labeled as in the game files. In the game files, Gaster's theme is just called Him just like the image on the old version of the Deltarune website. Repeatedly, Gaster is invoked with just the word, him. If you like listening to Deltarune's soundtrack, you may know where this is going. <laughs> the first song we hear in Deltarune, the one that plays in this sequence where you're creating a vessel, on official soundtracks and even readily accessible in the game files. You can see what it's called. It's called Another Him. Let me say outright what I believe this means. Gaster's theme in Undertale was just titled Him. So, because we're getting another track that's very similar to it, this is... another Him. It's another Him track. There are plenty of comparison videos on YouTube showing how these tracks are similar. I trust that you can hear the similarities and understand why people think this way. That said, another Him. Let's dissect the relevance of another Gaster's theme being here. This guy that's speaking in the opening. He's... Well, he's Gaster. It's hard to argue otherwise. But let's go over that later. For now, let's take a step back. It may have seemed strange to focus on the nature of determination in Undertale when Deltarune only focuses on the concept of determination as it is an emotion. The reason why I did that is primarily because of what we're going to talk about now. You see, determination and darkness are very similar conceptually. What would happen if you were to make the concept of determination, a strong emotion like that, into a physical substance? What could it do? What would happen if you were to make the concept of darkness, something so powerfully conceptual, into a physical substance? 
what could it do? And so here, we're now finally on the same page. You don't know what could be in the dark. Theoretically, there could be anything in darkness. Monsters, demons. Kids play pretend in the dark because that way, it's easier to imagine. If you aren't seeing what's physically in front of you, no matter how unlikely it might be, there could be anything there. There could be an entire world for you to explore. People to meet. Anything is possible in the dark. Deltarune is turning this very real phenomenon into a physical element within its universe. As long as you have the will to create, the imagination, a desire for fantasy, it can be created. It can give these existing objects, toys, anything, entire backstories, motivations. It's making that practice a real, tangible thing that can happen. But with that, it's still darkness we're talking about. We're talking about the actual, real thing in real life. Darkness. The thing about darkness, though, is that darkness is just the absence of light. That's how it is in real life. If we take this concept and run with it, imagine what else is possible with this framework, darkness being the same darkness we have in real life, this inevitably becomes something to think about. A deeper revelation falls upon us. Everything is made on top of darkness. This, I think, is informed by what we were talking about earlier, with darkness standing in for the very concept of imagination itself. Darkness is something that has to exist in Deltarune's world. Just as there has to be imagination in our world for anything to be possible, the same is true for darkness. There has to be a balance of light, real life, and darkness, fantasy. You need to be able to imagine that you can own a house, get a better education, you need to have determination in that possibility in order for it to exist. These concepts are what Deltarune is exploring with its world. Broadly, you can say light stands in for reality in the same way darkness stands in for fantasy, though because it's dissecting these ideas of getting too lost in your imagination, it focuses more on darkness. With that, it makes sense to frame the light world as more basic than the dark world. Even deeper into that reveal, you get into the idea that in order for anything to exist in the first place, you must first imagine it. The point with Deltarune. One of its core messages is how you have to not get too obsessed with fantasy. This applies to mind palaces, dreams, fantasy worlds you come up with on a whim with your friends, and more, but it also applies to fiction. And so this becomes something about Deltarune itself. This is a game, Deltarune, that is telling you how dangerous it is to be obsessed with fiction. It's fiction telling you not to get obsessed with fiction. In doing that, though, doesn't that kind of feel... hypocritical? If you don't know anything about Undertale or Deltarune, let me make something clear. These games have enough time to indulge as to literally have sequences where you go back through every area of the game to talk to every single minor character, and they all have new dialogue. Both these games are obsessed with themselves. The fact Gaster exists in Undertale alone is something very self-indulgent, you could say. Make no mistake, Undertale knows this about itself. It knows that there is so much for you to indulge in. One of Undertale's key messages is about the nature of this obsession. If you don't know what happens in the evil route of Undertale, let me just tell you the gist. Undertale is an RPG with a unique battle system. It defies genre conventions by having battles be won not through fighting, but through befriending people. The game teaches this to you from the beginning. Undertale makes it very clear that this is the standard way to play. Essentially what makes these games unique is that it replaces video game cues with social ones. The evil playthrough of Undertale. It happens because you stop engaging with that. You kill a bunch of enemies like other RPGs to get stronger. I want to stress this. This is something that is impossibly unlikely without you going out of your way to do it. Undertale makes it very clear that its unique battle system is the easier way to go about things, and the most full way to play. This makes the choice to fight Undertale's characters something so incredibly deliberate. 
you're hurting these characters because it's an option. Even though you might have got attached to them, even though you might have fixed all their problems, you rip it away from them because you want more from the game, and in this way, you are obsessed with it. You bring everything to its limit because of this. Even if you feel bad, even if you don't, you aren't playing the game because of that. It's because you're curious. This much is said by the final boss of the evil route. I know your type. You're, uh, very determined, aren't you? You'll never give up, even if there's, uh, absolutely no benefit to persevering whatsoever. If I can make that clear, no matter what, you'll just keep going. Not out of any desire for good or evil, but just because you think you can. And because you can, you have to. I'll say one of their statements here again. No matter what, you'll just keep going. Not out of any desire for good or evil, but just because you think you can. Not out of any desire for good or evil. This is an important thing to focus on because Undertale is such an emotionally resonant game for people. Undertale understands that you're not playing the game this way because you're an evil person. That seems obvious, right? You're just somebody playing a video game. Regardless, however, the game ramps up in difficulty, becomes more tedious, because you're playing it this way, because you're killing people. This is Undertale's way of punishing the player. But as I'll say again, it doesn't mean the game is saying you're evil for playing it. If a video game doesn't want you to play it a certain way, it just wouldn't let you do it. It wouldn't react to whatever you're doing. The evil route in Undertale, it's not only an option for people to take, it's a plethora of new content, featuring new bosses, plenty of new dialogue. It changes dramatically the way you progress in the game. And so we wrap back around to things feeling hypocritical. The contradiction in Undertale's evil route is that it understands what you're doing is evil, that choosing the evil route in games is bad in some sense, yet it still exists. It gives you the option to play it. It's not expected for a game to acknowledge this contradiction, but that's what Undertale does. Obsessing over the nature of this world, wanting to see all of it, it makes a point about the nature of video games in general. The main villain of this game, Flowey, bears a sentiment to you in the evil route which you're very much supposed to relate to. At first, I used my powers for good. I became friends with everyone. I solved all their problems flawlessly. Their companionship was amusing, for a while. As time repeated, people proved themselves predictable. What would this person say if I gave them this? What would they do if I said this to them? Once you know the answer, that's it. That's all they are. It all started because I was curious. Curious what would happen if I killed them. I don't like this, I told myself. I'm just doing this because I have to know what happens. <laughs> What an excuse! You of all people must know how liberating it is to act this way. Now, that last bit might sound a little strange. You of all people must know how liberating it is to act this way. I've been focusing so far on the nature of obsession with Undertale's world through the lens of someone who just wants to see what happens, though there's another side to that coin as well. Some people just actually want to get as strong as possible in the game by any means necessary. Some people also actively dislike the characters, enjoy killing them. However unlikely that might sound to you as a possibility, it is one. This is another thing Undertale accounts for with its story. And while we won't get too deep into it now, it's important to say that yes, this is another thing Undertale is aware of. Your obsession with getting as strong as possible, even actively going against the game's expected path, is accounted for in this way. These two sides of obsession. It's a big part of Undertale. The need to do everything, and the need to get stronger. These are themes which are being expanded upon with darkness in Deltarune. Thus far we've talked about how darkness is standing in for the concept of fantasy, and how Deltarune's messaging tells us that we shouldn't get too obsessed with it. Much like Undertale, what Deltarune is doing is making a similarly contradictory point about itself and the nature of obsession. Deltarune wants us to not get too obsessed with fantasy, to not indulge so much to the point where it destroys us, yet it gives us a wonderful world for us to play around in. We can spend so much time just living here instead of living in the light world, and yet, 
Light and dark must remain in balance in order for us to lead healthy lives, for things to not turn into chaos. It wants us to engage with these characters, but we can't get so extremely lost in it. But that's not all it focuses on with darkness, even. Because Deltarune understands that the process of creating is so special in its own right, that there has to be some level of imagination in order for us to believe in ourselves, believe that things can get better. It's not just focusing on getting lost in fantasy, with fantasy being something that already exists. You can get so lost in creating that all else will cease to matter, and that's a bad thing, despite how wonderful creating can be. You can create an entire world, but it will never replace reality. Creating is good, but if you become too obsessed with it, things can get dangerous. This goes even deeper, however. Deltrun already examines these themes through the lens of characters who come from the dark world and characters who come from the light world. King has endless ambition and thinks that covering the world in darkness will allow him to rule it. You can see how this translates the concept of fantasy, dreaming, into motivations for a character. Noelle at the end of chapter 2 talks about how the dark world is just better, by most accounts. We know how difficult her life is in the light world, so it makes sense she thinks this way so readily. It makes sense that she and Birdly would want to live in fantasy forever. These are reasons to create a dark world. So let's wrap back around to entry number 17. It seems clear now what's taking place here. Gaster's experimenting with darkness in Undertale's world. As we've gone over, Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys. His job was to dream big, to imagine what was possible in a world where freedom seems out of reach. It's not hard to infer what comes next. Gaster is said to have shattered across time and space. While he gives us context about Undertale, we get to know that he created the core. It's not what's important about him. What's important about him is that he disappeared one day. What's important about him is that he is the one who created Deltarune. Let's talk about something you may or may not be aware of. Back when the first chapter of Deltarune was released, on Twitter, the official Undertale account did something. It started the day before Chapter 1 dropped. The account's layout went completely black. Toby Fox, again, the creator of Undertale and Deltarune, makes a tweet. It's cold. It's as if everything had been enveloped in a black wind. You didn't realize it yet, but it seems that there's someone who wants to talk to you. Then it happens. Welcome. The mysterious person speaks in all capitals. It tells us that it has something to show us, but that it is not finished yet. Calls what it has to show us very, very interesting. When you hover over the black spaces that make up its name, you see that it's six of them. A day goes by. Thank you for waiting so long. After all, you and I, we have both been waiting such a very long time. So to be here, finally, on the verge of connection, is quite exciting. Now, show yourself! And that is how the game dropped. Let's say some things about this. Considering that one of the last things said in entry number 17 is very, very interesting, it makes sense to assume that this is relevant to that. Then let's take in the fact that the name here is six spaces. Gaster is made up of six letters. Naturally, it seems obvious to assume this is Gaster speaking, but an important part of that is also how, well, back when Deltarune dropped, the Deltarune website looked different. Again, it had this message with this text. Welcome. Please read these final warnings. Then, take it in your hands. This text is glowing in the same way this text is glowing when we start Deltarune. Naturally, we have to assume these are the same people. Gaster is the one behind Deltarune. What this means in its entirety, I don't feel capable of answering. 
but considering what we've gone over, with how he introduces the concept of darkness to us, it seems natural to assume he'll have some overarching relevance, be it as a final boss or otherwise. It's undeniable that he is an important character, to put it lightly. He is the first one you talk to in the game. He's been in the game over screen like Asgore was in Undertale. He even talks to you a lot in the save file selection screen up until you beat a chapter. Darkness being a part of the plot is built around fantasy. Dreaming big, hoping for the best. It makes sense that the person hired to do that, to build a better future for the underground, would get wrapped up in that. Gaster is a really interesting character, just conceptually, but really we've still only scratched the surface with all there is to say about him. He perfectly embodies the aura around old video game rumors and secrets, that secretly, there's something more sinister going on under the surface of this classic fantasy game. I'll say now that for the most part, the series won't be focusing too much on him. Talking about darkness, he's necessary to bring up, and that's why he's got such a big presence in this video. We're not going to completely stop talking about him next time, however. I still haven't told you how people decipher these symbols, remember? And well, it's kind of a doozy. See, what you're looking at right now, it's actually a font. Gaster, he speaks in a unique font. You might have caught this earlier as well, but one of the G followers, they don't just call him Dr. Gaster, they call him Dr. W.D. Gaster. W.D. stands for something. It stands for the font he's named after and speaks in. Winged Next time on Deltarune Theory, we'll look into the two other characters named after fonts that we know of, answer why there's a connection between them and Gaster, and answer, definitively, what the timeline between Undertale and Deltarune actually is. outro music I commissioned for the series by Lunaxis. You can find their SoundCloud and Twitter linked in the description. Resources used in the creation of this video are listed as well in a Google Doc, also in the description. This includes things like wiki pages and a full list of all the music I used in the video.